Amen. So just on a side note, um, I'm going to do this on Sunday as well, but I really want to encourage you. Uh, I have said from the beginning that President Trump will be our president. And I love the way scripture reads, everything's impossible before a miracle comes. Uh, and it's usually at 11.59 and 47 seconds. Sometimes in my case, it's been 11.59 and 58 seconds. But God never shows up late. And so I just want to read you this and let the Lord encourage you with his word tonight. So it's entitled, and it's on our bulletin for Sunday, and you'll, you'll get it on Sunday, but I wanted to get, I'm so excited about the word the Lord gave me. Trust the character of God. Not your experiences, not what you think God can or can't do, but trust the character of God, okay? So as we enter into the new year, let us trust God's eternal character to do that which is good in our land. He says he will. We already have the victory in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? So I'm going to give you some scriptures here. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. Behold, you among the nations and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days that even if it were told to you, you will not believe it. And then Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. Fear not, stand still, and see the deliverance or the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen. That's a picture, a picture of the world, the worldly ones. You shall see them again no more forever. Oh, I pray that's true. <laughs> the Lord will fight for you and you will be quiet and hold your peace. Then 1 Thessalonians 5.24, Faithful is God who has called you, who also will do it. And uh, John chapter 20 and verse 29, this is the story about Thomas, when the disciples had seen Thomas, or seen Jesus, but Thomas wasn't there. So Thomas said, you know, un until I see the, the prints of the nails in his hands and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. And then, of course, when he saw Jesus, Jesus said, come here, put, put, put your fingers in, in the holes and put your hand in my side and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas, do you remember what he said to him? My Lord and my God. That was a confession. That wasn't an exclamation. That wasn't like, oh my goodness. That was my Lord and my God. And then the next verse, John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And that's what God's doing right now in our land. He's looking among Christians in our land to see who's going to believe even though we don't see yet. And I'm telling you right now, thus saith the Lord, God is going to use those who hold on to his promises. He's going to use those who hold on to his promises. And then Psalm 46.10, he says, be still and know that I'm God. So I wrote over here, just wait and then you'll see. See, in, in America, we say, show me and I'll believe it. In heaven, God says, no, you believe it, and then I'll show you. So the Lord is about to do something amazing in our nation. It will bring glory and honor to his name. And we as Christians should be the example. We do not walk by what we see. We walk by what we know. Our God is mighty to save. And then I put Psalm 64, verses 9 and 10. We had a great word on our Thursday night Bible study from a young man who really um, doesn't share a lot of scripture. He shares a lot of stories and he shares a lot of prayer requests, but this time he shared scripture and man, it was right on. And here it is. And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. And the righteous will be glad in the Lord and will trust in him and all the upright in heart shall glory or rejoice. I promise you in Jesus name, I would not step out on a limb like that if I didn't know for sure. I know for sure. And I want to just share with you that during the time that I had uh, the, the baddest uh, legal firm in town telling me, the sheriff's coming, here's your warning. 
You're gonna, you know, our house was auctioned off in Santa Barbara, and it was sold, and we were told to get out, and the Lord told me, you're not going anywhere. And uh, one time I shook a little bit in my faith and started to take one photograph off the wall, and the Lord said, if you remove that photograph, you'll lose your home. So I just put the little staple back in it. And I'm serious, 95% of my friends thought I was crazy. One guy was gossiping behind my back and said, we'll see what Mr. Spiritual's going to do when he's out in the street without even a pair of underwear because he didn't pack anything. And you know, God sent me to that guy's house and tell him, I forgive you. I love you. I know everybody was upset during this trial. It's okay. And uh, he wouldn't even answer the door. And I told him through the door, I love you and I forgive you and God bless you and I'm not upset with you at all. Uh, he ended up uh, later moving to Nevada a few weeks later. So it really affected people because when you believe God for something and God shows you it's going to happen. I mean, think about this. Think about what Joseph and Mary endured. You can hear the gossip in Nazareth. Remember, she was there for eight months. The Bible says when they went to Bethlehem, her days, not her months or her weeks, but her days were accomplished that she should deliver a son. So for eight months, she was in, in, uh, in Nazareth, and she kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and you know people were, I can't believe it. Joseph didn't take her outside the city and have her stoned? That's the law. You mean to tell me he's going to marry someone and that's not even his child? And you know how the gossip goes. Think about the things they had to endure. But they stuck with the word of God. They went to Bethlehem. And I mean, God moved the whole nation around just to get him to Bethlehem. Think about that. How Cyrenius had first started the taxes, and then, and then uh, Herod said, okay, everybody go back to your home city. God did that just for them, so the prophecy could be fulfilled. And I tell you, there have been prophets in the land saying exactly the same thing. And it was interesting because I said it just out of what God showed me, and then people kept telling me, did you listen to this guy? Did you listen to that guy? Did you listen to this guy? Did you listen to that guy? Look, I know there's a lot of false prophets in the land, but there's some real ones too. And there's some ones who are tried, true, and proven, and the things they've said have surely come to pass. And I believe with all my heart, I'm not going to change. And I got mocked at the Harley shop the other day. Uh, these guys were all talking about, what are we going to do when Biden gets in? And I said, the fact of it is, he's not going to get in. In fact, he's going he's to have to concede, and he's going to do it in shame. Just like I preached when I preached the message on Sennacherib, how Sennacherib puffed himself up and he went home with his tail between his legs, ashamed, right back where he came from, and his own family killed him. And I don't believe Biden's family is going to kill him, but I think their sin and their crookedness is going to kill him politically. So that's a free commercial tonight. Uh, <laughs> But I am telling you, I know what I know, and I know what God showed me. And, and then when you hear all the experts, and, and that thing you sent me last night, Kathy, that, uh, that prophecy of those three prophets and that other guy, it was like, wow, that is such confirmation. And you know, you can't forget the scripture by two or three words, by two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And that's where I kind of modeled the style of teaching that I do by two or three witnesses. You don't just take one scripture out of context and say, well, this is what it is. If you find other scriptures in the Bible that agree with that and show the same thing, that brings proof by two or three witnesses, every word will be established. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 4, and I hope you're encouraged with that. And I know, I know it goes against the grain, but you read the Bible, everything in the Bible is against the grain. Everything is against the grain. And praise God for it. Because he does these things for his own name's sake. Why should his name be polluted? He will not give his glory to any man. God himself is going to get this victory. Nobody, the Supreme Court or nobody else is going to be able to fix this. God himself is going to fix this. And it's going to be amazing. Praise the Lord. Yes.
Yeah, in Los Angeles, they are. Yeah, I think uh, John, uh, uh, Pastor John, what's his last name? MacArthur. Uh, I think he scared him. All the churches now are open in Los Angeles. So uh, I just believe it's time. God is looking in the nation to see who is going to stand up for righteousness. Who is going to quit misquoting Romans 13 and understand that authorities are to bless the righteous and punish the wicked, not punish the righteous and bless the wicked. You know, when it's punishing the righteous and blessing the wicked, it's not an authority from the Lord. God doesn't do that. God always blesses the, the, the righteous and he always punishes the wicked. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 4. This is the Apostle John. And I want you to notice the personal pronouns as we read them, okay? And, I, and of course, we all learned that in school. Personal program, pronouns are me and I. Okay, so that doesn't include anyone else. It's kind of like the... <laughs> forgive me, Lord. It's kind of like a lot of millennials that I've met. You know, it's me, 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 I, I, I. And not all of them. We have a lot of godly ones in our church. But I'm just saying I've run across some that their whole mindset is, how does this affect me? Because the whole world's about me. So listen to what John says here. Revelation 4 and verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, there was a door opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was that were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up here, which is uh, akin to you come up here, okay? And I will show you, there's another personal pro pronoun, things which must be hereafter. Now, I just want to park there for just a minute because it was a popular teaching for a lot of years that this was the rapture. This is not the rapture. For, for four more chapters, you won't read anything about the church being in heaven at all. In chapter 7 and verse 9 is where you see the church. You don't see the church here. You see the apostle John here. So he goes on to say, And immediately I, there's number five, was in the spirit. And behold, there was a throne set in heaven, and one who sat upon the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne, and it looked like emerald. So this rainbow was like a, an emerald, and emeralds are green right around the throne. And around about the throne were four and twenty elders. He didn't say a multitude which no man could number. He said twenty-four elders. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne, by the way, where do you think they came from? Matthew 27, uh, 52 says this. And the earth quaked and the rocks rent and many of the bodies of the saints came out of the graves and went into the holy city. So what do you think God did with the bodies when he was done? Took them to heaven. Remember, spirits don't wear white robes. And John saw people dressed in white robes, and I believe those were Old Testament saints that came out of the graves, went into the holy city, preached the good news, and then resurrected with Christ. So it goes on to say, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne there were four beasts. They were full of eyes in front and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third beast had a face like a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings around him. And they were full of eyes within, and they don't rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sit on the throne, 
and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Wow, that's such a great story. Let's go back and take a look. Verse 1. What did John hear? Well, the Bible says he heard a trumpet. And who was the trumpet speaking to? Him personally. He was exiled on the island of Patmos, which is just off the west coast of modern-day Turkey. That's where the seven churches were located. We just studied all of those in chapter 3 and chapter 2. So all the seven churches were in the mainland. It was then called Asia, but now it's called Turkey. And right off the west coast of all of those churches in modern-day Turkey was an island called Patmos. And John had been exiled to that island because of his beliefs. So he hears this trumpet. And who was God asking to come up there? Him. There was no one else asked to come up. It was all personal pronouns. Okay? And listen to some of them. I looked. I heard. It was talking with me. And God said, I will show you. So God was obviously talking with John alone. So I want to center in on God's personal relationship with us. Okay? I know he has a collective relationship with the body of Christ. But I want to center in on, he has a personal relationship with you, Jack. And Pam with you. And Robert, when you were in your mother's womb, God had a personal relationship with you. He personally touched you. So let's take a look. Psalm 139. And it's self-explanatory. We'll just read it. Psalm in the middle of your Bible, Psalm 139. And I want to go through the first 12 verses. So this is a Psalm of David. And David cries out, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. And that word know isn't like we know who the president is or we know who the mayor is. We don't know them. We just know who they are. God says, he knows us intimately, everything about us. Verse 2, you know my downsetting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. I've said it and maybe you said it too. No one understands where I'm at. Oh, yes, there is someone who understands where you're at. God understands where you're at. I've talked to people during the Christmas season and they're saying... Oh man, I, I have up days, I have down days. God knows all about that. It says right here, you know my down sitting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. You surround my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but you, O oh Lord, know it. Altogether, you have beset me behind and before, and you've laid your hand upon me. Where did you do that at? In the lowest parts of the earth, when you were in your mother's womb. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, and I can't understand it or attain to it or grab it. So, where shall I go from your spirit? How shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold me. By the way, God's right hand is Jesus Christ. God's always got us. You know, you know that song, he's got the whole world in his hand? Probably came from that verse. Verse 11. If I say, well, surely the darkness is covering me. Even the night will be light round about me. Because the darkness does not hide from God. But the night shines just like the day. And the darkness and the light are both alike to the Lord. Amen? 
So it's a personal relationship that God knows everything about us. And maybe when you were growing up, you had a parent or a loved one or even a friend tell you uh, something critical about your personality. God made you the way he made you. God doesn't make mistakes. I remember when my daughter, Christina, was young, and I, I hate to say this, but her grandmother was a hypochondriac times 20. She, was just, she had a whole cabinet full of pills and prescriptions. It was unbelievable. When I say a whole cabinet, I don't mean you open the cabinet door. I mean you open five cabinet doors all above the, the sink there, just full of bottles of pills and prescriptions. And so she began to tell my eight-year-old daughter, your nose is too big. You need, to, you need to talk to your dad about getting a nose job. And I would hear this at the breakfast table. I was a single parent. And my daughter would say, Dad, I, I need to have something done to my nose. My nose is too big. And finally one day I'd had it. I lost it. And I just said, okay, so Christina, what you're saying is that God made a mistake when he formed you in the mother's womb. God, does God make mistakes? I never heard another word out of her about that. And of course, now she's grown and her nose is perfect. And she's a beautiful young lady. And uh, I am so glad that grandma didn't have the power to take her to some surgeon and have her nose messed with. And you know, some of these people in Hollywood, they get their lips and their cheeks and everything. It's like somebody took dry ice and froze their face. You know, it's amazing how people mess with God's creation. God made us perfect. And that's all I wanted to share out of verse 1 is God knew everything about John. And this was a personal touch just for John. In verse 2, the Bible says that John was immediately in the spirit. And he saw. So we know that he didn't go there in his body because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So even those elders that were in heaven, dressed in the white robes, they're not in their natural bodies. Okay. By the way, those bodies were raised from the grave. When they went into heaven, they got their spiritual bodies. You can ask them when you get there. But the bottom line is, is, is he had eyes to see, and he saw what the prophet of God, Isaiah, prophesied about God. So let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 6. The book of Isaiah, in the sixth chapter, remember he saw the throne with the emerald a rainbow around it and all those things. Isaiah chapter 6, and starting with verse 1. So Isaiah had a vision, and he describes it in chapter 6. And in verse 1 he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne. Now, Isaiah said he didn't dream it. He said he saw it. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Where have we heard that before? With two of them, he covered his face. Why? Because the glory of God is so bright, you'll be blinded. So with two of them, they covered their face. With two of them, they covered their feet. And with two of them, they used to fly. And one cried unto another, verse 3, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, when John saw them, they were still saying the same thing. Verse 4. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Wow. So some 720 years before Christ was born, Isaiah gets this vision, and David, I think, longer than that. I think David was before Isaiah, a thousand years. So they both saw the same thing. And then here's John, the apostle, two you know, a, a, a thousand years, well, a thousand seven hundred years later, sees the exact same thing. Two or three witnesses, every word will be established. So in verse 3, John sees God on the throne, and Ezekiel had the same vision. So let's check out Ezekiel. You were in Isaiah, so if you turn to the right, 
you'll come to Ezekiel once you pass uh, Jeremiah and Lamentations. In Ezekiel chapter 1, starting with verse 26. Ezekiel 1 and 26. He says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness and the appearance of a man above on it. Now, who would that man be? That would be Jesus. Amen, the Son of Man. Verse 27. And I saw as the color of amber and as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins and upward and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had a brightness round about as the appearance of a bow or a rainbow that's in the cloud in the day of rain. So was that appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And then I heard a voice of one who spoke. Wow, how'd you like to be there? We've had three of those in our church. Pastor Loida, who's here tonight, saw angels all around the church. Alma, who sings up here, saw angels all around the church. And your daughter's friend, whose name is Princess, saw the glory of the Lord behind me while I was preaching. She saw, she said, like, she couldn't make out a face. She said it was just a bright light around me. And then the whole, that she saw in the spirit. You know, we see the five things. We taste, touch, smell, etc. But the sixth sense is covered up. The one behind our physical senses, she got to see into that. So did John, so did Ezekiel, so did Isaiah, uh, so did uh, Pastor Loida, so did Alma, and so did Princess. I'd love to see something like that. I guess the Lord uh, just gave me other things to see, but he didn't let me see anything like that. In verse 4, the 24 elders, now some people will sit and break up a church over this. It's the, tw it's the 12 apostles and the 12 heads of the tribes of Israel. Hey, I don't know who it is. It just says 24 elders. Does it really matter? The, the, the thing that matters is that they're there. So the 24 elders, possibly the 12 apostles and the 12 heads of the tribes of Israel. But remember what 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 says. It says, now brethren, we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs us up. However, love builds us up. And then he goes into verse 2 just to put a disclaimer on anything we think we might know. He says, if any man thinks himself to know something, he knoweth yet nothing as he ought to know it. So we have this, we see now darkly, but then face to face. So all I can do is share what I know darkly. But then we'll know even as we are known, the scripture says, for we'll have the mind of Christ. So right now we have to be content. And you know, we, we are, we're like the Greeks in the, in, the, uh, in the time of Paul. They just live to find something new every day. <laughs> okay, and the fact of it is, sometimes it's none of our business. Sometimes it's just about just trust God. You don't have to see it. If God says it, it'll happen. You don't have to see it. Just trust the Lord. And I really think that's the era we're in right now, is the just shall live by faith. The just will live by faith. So in verse 5, uh, we read about the seven flames or the seven spirits of God. And that can be troubling because the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, there's one God, one spirit, one Lord. So where do we get seven spirits from? Okay, so let's, take, let's look into that. First of all, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. You know, and these are all things that when you read the scripture, you say, what does that mean? And that's why God says, study to show yourself approved unto God. So that's why we study. So we can find out what do these things mean. Amen? So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says this, For through him we both have access by 
one spirit unto the Father. Now, remember the scripture that talks about the fruit of the spirit? Now, the fruit of the spirit is love. God says the fruit of the spirit is love, but it has facets like a diamond. Okay, joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and temperance and faith. Those are the facets of God's spirit, the, the gifts of the spirit, which, are, which is love. And love looks like joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and meekness and temperance and faith. So, don't you think that the spirit of God has different qualities as well? And that's what God is talking about. Not seven separate spirits, but a sevenfold spirit of God. Seven different aspects to what the Holy Spirit does. So we'll take a look in just a minute. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, the scripture says, We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit even as you were called in the hope of your in one hope of your calling okay so there we get again one spirit and then let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2 so there's only one spirit or the spirit of god there's a lot of wicked spirits but there's one spirit of god So Isaiah talks about the peaceable kingdom of the Messiah. And in verse, chapter 11 and verse 1, he says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now remember, Jesse was David's father. So he's the stem that's coming out of the rod of Jesse. And a branch will grow out of his roots. In other words, the Messiah comes through the house of David. Amen? Now look at verse 2. So where, are, where is this sevenfold Spirit of God? All right, now watch. The Spirit of the Lord, count with me, number one, shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit of understanding. The Spirit of counsel. The Spirit of might. The Spirit of knowledge. And of the fear of the Lord. So God's Spirit, just like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith, just like that, God's Spirit, it's the Spirit of the Lord and the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding. Now, what's the difference between the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding? Okay, you know where the Scripture says, with all thy getting, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we've got to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. We all have knowledge. Okay, so wisdom has something to do with knowledge, what you know, right? So wisdom is how to apply the knowledge. That's what wisdom is, knowing how to apply the knowledge that you have. Well, what's understanding? Understanding is knowing when to apply the wisdom. Because you can know how to do it, but if you do it at the wrong time, you're going to blow it right out of the water. And see, I think that's what the wicked are doing right now is they're pushing God's agenda and they're trying to get this one world government in and this one world currency and, and the mark of the beast. It's not God's time yet. It is not God's timing yet. Oh, that's coming. But I believe because God has seen the righteous in our land praying and fasting and believe in God for the goodness of God and the mercy of God, like Isaiah 54.10 says, the mountains will shake and the hills will fall, but my mercy will not depart from you, saith the Lord who hath mercy upon thee. So God has mercy. And think about this. God isn't going to judge America on the ungodly. Those aren't his children. God doesn't spank children that aren't his. God corrects his children. God is looking at us, the believers in the land, to see how are we going to react. And if we react in the right way, and you've got a pattern of that in Scripture, Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham came to God and said, please don't burn the city, my nephew's there. And God said, okay, if you can find 50 righteous, I won't burn the cities. And they came back and said, well, how about 40? <laughs> how about 30? 20? 10? Going once, going twice? 5? No? How about 1? And then they had to leave. But don't tell me that there aren't 
hundreds of thousands of righteous in America. You know, we don't want to be like, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to think of his name right now, the guy that called down fire from heaven, Elijah. We don't want to be like Elijah and say, I'm the only one left. There's no one left. God says, oh, stop it. There's 7,000 other righteous ones in the land. And there are many thousands in America who trust God and who believe and who walk with the Lord and who listen to the Lord and who believe the Lord. And so because of them, God will have mercy on our land. Don't think that he won't have judgment. There's judgments coming. Read Revelation chapter 18 and 19. Judgment's definitely coming. But it's not God's time yet. Because why? God is not willing, 2 Peter 3, 9, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God is still squeezing the grapes of the earth, getting that revival to come before he comes to take us home. And in the midst of the revival, guess what's going on? A great falling away. So you have the tree being shaken and, and some falling off because they're not real. And then God's bringing in the real, because who's he coming back for? A peculiar and a holy people. He's coming back for a holy church, a church that worships him and fears him. Amen? Not an entertainment church. So in Isaiah, he tells us he has a sevenfold spirit, and that's followed up in Revelation chapter 1. If we'll turn back to Revelation in chapter 1 and verse 4, says this. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him who is and who was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Again, one spirit, seven attributes. But God separated them by just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, but three different offices. Okay, so now take a look with me at Zechariah chapter 3, the book of Zechariah. So what are the lamps of fire? What's that about? So in the book of Zechariah, past Zephaniah, by the way. <laughs> okay, Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Now where did we read that? We just read it, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. God said he's going to bring forth a branch, and then he talks about the Spirit. Look at verse 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Isn't that interesting? Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In one day. So, again, the seven eyes. And then, of course, you, you see that the Spirit of the Lord is everywhere. John chapter 4 and verse 24. God is a spirit, and they who worship the Lord must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? So I hope that kind of explains the seven lamps of fire representing each attribute of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Verses 6 through 8 in Revelation, we're back in chapter 4 now. Revelation chapter 4. Verses 6 and 8, John sees the throne room floor and it appears like a sea of glass, like crystal. And I remember way back when I was a brand new believer, uh, a certain preacher described the sea of glass as the saints of God. And I wondered when I heard that teaching, why would we be standing on the head of the saints of God? Because it says they were standing on the throne room floor. So a deeper study of that, Revelation chapter 15, if you would. Uh, the sea of glass is a sea of glass. It's like crystal. Okay, uh, Actually, gold in heaven is clear. It's pure gold. So in Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, John says, I saw another sign in heaven. It was great and it was marvelous. There were seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. 
And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, so he separates the sea of glass and those who had gotten the victory over the beast. Do you see it? So he said, and over the image and over his mark and over the number of his name, and they were standing on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So how can the sea of glass be the people when the people are standing on the sea of glass? Amen. <laughs> so you gotta, it's got to make sense. You can't just make a doctrine and say, here it is. That's why we do what the scripture says in Acts chapter 17, I believe it's verse 11, where the apostle Paul said, now those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. So those, those Christians had scriptures and Paul would preach and they would go home and study the scripture to see if what Paul said was true. Amen? So John also saw four beasts full of eyes in front and in back and that's back in Ezekiel, remember when he talks about the beast and they have eyes all around him in front and behind? Okay, so Ezekiel saw that too. So let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 1 again. Back to uh, just before the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, the first chapter. And starting with verse 4. So here's Ezekiel giving his testimony. Ezekiel chapter 1, starting with verse 4. I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. There was a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And there was a brightness around about it, and out of the middle of it, there was like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And also out of the midst of it came a likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces. Every one had four wings. Their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Remember we read that. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And the four of them had faces and their wings. And their wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. And for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they had four had the face of an ox, and they had a face of an eagle on the other side. And thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward, Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward. Whether the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. And as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. And like the appearance of lamps. Somebody described this one time and says, Wow, it sounds like flying saucers. And I said, That's not what it says. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to try to peddle that one in these last days. And I'm guaranteeing you that's demon spirits. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. So they were fast. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, one wheel was upon the earth by a living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like under the color of a barrel. That's B-E-R-Y-L. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And you might say, what are they describing? Your guess is as good as mine. I'm not going to get stuck on that. I'm not going to go down a rabbit trail and never come back up. It's one of those things where God says it's a mystery. So just accept it as a truth that has not yet been revealed. We'll get to see that when we get to heaven. But right now, it's pretty much like as if God were Italian and he was just saying, it's none of you business. Okay, there's some things that aren't our business. We just have to take it by faith and believe God. 
So in verse 17, the scripture says, when they went, they went upon their four sides and they turned not when they went. And as for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about these four. (laughs) I don't know what that is, but you know what? It's in scripture. John described it. He described it. Isaiah saw it. Praise God. We'll see it when we see it. Remember what Jesus said? You see now darkly, but then face to face. You will know even as you are known because you'll have the mind of Christ. So there are some things right now, our finite mind. Okay, so think about this. I can't even figure out how a cell phone works. How is it that I punch some numbers on this little square box and talk to somebody in England in two seconds? And and it knows to go to their phone and not somebody else's all over Europe. How does that work? And if you can figure that out, try to figure out what happens when I flip one of them switches and all these lights come on. It's a mystery. And there are some people that can give you theory And they can say, well, you know, you put the ground in the ground and then you hook up capacitors and you hook up resistors and and then it goes to the filament in the light. Yeah, well, that's all good, but how does it work? (laughs) All I know is it's cool to flip on the switch and get light. I could care less how it works, as long as it works. Amen? See, I I think sometimes we get caught up in these, uh, we, we strain at a gnat and we swallow a camel. And, and it's just important for us to have faith and believe. We'll see it when we get there. Doesn't God say in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart or imagination of man the things that God is preparing for those who love him? So we, we can't even imagine the stuff that God's made for us. But it's going to be fun when we get there. I know it's going to be fun because in Psalm 1611, God says, we'll have fullness of joy. In other words, can't even deal with one more drop of joy or we're going to fall down. Just fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. I can't even imagine that. It's hard to get my brain around that. Think about this. How many people we think are on the earth? They say around 8 billion. God knows everybody's thoughts, all 8 billion. He knows their thoughts afar off, even before they think them. He knows where everybody is, what they're thinking. He's hearing all 8 billion prayers at once. How does that happen? He's God and we're not. We'll figure it out when we get there. And we may never figure it out, but we'll worship him and say mighty and glory and honor and power to our king. So verse 9, the beasts are doing something. They're crying, holy, holy, holy. Who are they giving glory to? So let's take a look. Isaiah 42 and verse 8. Scripture's real plain about who they're giving glory to. And I guess this would be a warning to anyone who tries to steal God's glory. God gets the glory. God has all the power. Psalm 62, 11, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. It doesn't belong unto men. God gives us authority to use his power if we'll use it rightly. But here's what he says in Isaiah 42 and verse 8, I am the Lord. That is my name, God says, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise unto graven images. In other words, God's not going to give his praise to a hundred foot cross. God isn't going to give his praise to a tabernacle that's built out of crystal. God is going to keep his praise and his glory for himself because he alone deserves it. So 1 Corinthians one thirty one says... If any man glory, or if any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Hey, it's okay to boast, just boast in the Lord. Hallelujah. And in 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Hey, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Do it to the glory. You know, God loves to flex his godly muscles. 
God loves to flex his power. God loves it when his children, in spite of all the circumstances, say, our God is mighty and our God will deliver us. God delights in that. What he doesn't delight in is, oh, I don't know what's happening now. God doesn't delight in that. That upsets the Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I visited someone today in a care home. Uh, well, you guys know I'm Brother Frank. And he was telling me how people are so afraid all the time, just shaking in their boots. And, and you know, I, I saw that in Pismo Beach last week when I, I sat on a bench and I wasn't wearing a mask because a mask says, shut your mouth, you're not important, I don't even want to see who you are. So I'm not wearing a mask, Period. And so I'm sitting there without a mask on, and this policeman drove right by me on his motorcycle, signed right there, said, you got to wear a mask. Not going to do it. I'm standing up for righteousness. God didn't make me born with a mask. I'm not going to wear a mask. Plus, I've studied the science. Here's the science of a mask. The coronavirus is one micron. Look it up. Google it. The, the coronavirus is one micron. The best mask you can buy is an M95. It only stops up to three microns. So it's as stupid as saying, wow, Pam, a flood is coming to our neighborhood. We better put up a chain link fence. It doesn't help. Even the CDC now says it doesn't help. It's amazing how people are like sheeple Instead of people, it doesn't help. What helps is being around each other and sharing the viruses that we always share. It's called herd immunity. Why do you think the evil one wants to separate everyone? What does God say? If you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. Why? Because God created us for fellowship. And what does the evil one want to do? Put this one over here, that one over there, this one over here. Put the spirit of fear on them. Cause them to doubt God and have no faith. Unbelievable. And now God is looking for the true righteous in the land that will stand up and believe him. That's thus saith the Lord. Verse 10. So the 24 elders cast their crowns before the throne. Well, if they cast crowns, that means they had them. Well, the Bible says if we remain faithful unto death, God will give us a crown of life. And there's four other crowns. There's a crown of righteousness. There's a crown for being a martyr. There's other crowns that are listed in the scripture that we're going to obtain if we're faithful to the Lord. So these, these elders cast their crowns before the throne. Well, first of all, let's take a look at Revelation 4. And verse 4, Revelation 4 and verse 4, the scripture says, And round about the throne were 24 elders, uh, 24 seats, and upon the seats I saw 24 elders, and they were clothed in white raiment. That means they had bodies. Spirits don't wear clothes. Okay? And then they had on their heads crowns of gold. So they had the crowns, but then down here in verse 10, the Bible says they cast their crowns before the throne. Why? It's a picture of submission to Christ. In the Old Testament, when there was a fight and that opposing army lost, that king would submit his crown to the winning king. So it's a picture of submission to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Besides that, Christ is the only one that deserves crowns anyway. He's the one that gave us the breath to breathe and the, and, the, and, the, and the blood to run in our veins, and the arms and legs and fingers to do His will, and the mouth to speak. So anything we do is because He's enabled us to do it. We didn't do it on our own. So in, uh, the, it says they give all the glory to God. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, and 9 through 11 says, Every knee shall bow of things in heaven, Things on earth, things under the earth. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue, every knee. And then finally in closing, verse 11. Did you know that God created everything for him? 
that kind of kills the me, 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 I, I, I theory, huh? Now, he allows us to have the pleasure with it. Man, I love to go to beautiful places like Yosemite or the Grand Canyon and see the grandeur of God, even to the ocean, and just look out at that and wonder, how is that water not coming up on the street? And then in Deuteronomy, you can read that God has set the sand for a bound of the sea, that it cannot pass, even though the waves crash against it, it cannot pass those little grains of sand. Try to figure that out. It's amazing. Do you know how much water's out there? You ever just go out to the sea and look out on the ocean? And there, it's probably an innumerable amount of gallons in the ocean. Just in that ocean, the part we can see. And yet these little teensy grains of sand. And the way to really see how teensy they are is just go up there and get you a cup full of, of seawater. Take it home and just let it evaporate. What you got in the bottom is grains of sand. And they're so tiny, if you try to separate them, when you get one, you can barely see it. As we get older, we really need glasses or a magnifying glass to see it. Okay? I had one guy tell me this. I had to laugh. He goes, well, here's what I think. I think you come in bald and no teeth, and you go out bald and no teeth. <laughs> I said, okay, then there you go. <laughs> Oh, Lord. God has created all things for his pleasure. You know what Genesis 1-1 says. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God did it. In Genesis chapter 1, if you'll turn there with me, Genesis, the first chapter, and we're going to go to the very last verse. The first verse said, God created the heaven and the earth. The last verse says, And God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God doesn't make junk. That's what I told my daughter. God didn't make a mistake. Your nose is perfect. God doesn't make mistakes. He made you the way you are because that's who he wanted you to be. His design is perfect. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. They are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future and an expected end. God knows the, the architectural plan for each one of our lives. God saw everything. He said it's very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then Isaiah 48, 11, God says, I do these things for my own name's sake. Why should my name be polluted? I will not give my glory to any man. So God does it for himself. And then look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things, the same was in the beginning with God, the scripture says, Genesis chapter 1. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Talking about Jesus. So I want to summarize Revelation chapter 4, and then we can close. So this chapter reveals the glory of God and the power that's present in the setting of heaven. The power that's there, the 24 elders that are throwing their crowns, those four beasts that cried day and night for eternity. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. They're going to be doing it when we get up there. That's what they do for eternity. Anywhere we go in heaven, we're going to hear them. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That's all they do, all day, all night, forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, especially highlighted are the activities in heaven, which is worship, praise, and the adoration of the Lord and Him alone. Jesus is God and he's the center of attention in heaven. So my last statement tonight is, how much more should he be the center of our attention? Especially during this holiday uh, season and Christmas. These holy days that we're walking in. He should be the center of our attention. And man, there's so many things that are trying to steal 
our attention right now. All this crazy news and all the rumors and the gossip and all the bad news and oh, there's more shutdowns and this and that. God just wants us to stand up, walk in righteousness before Him, be bold as a lion and continue to obey Him. He will cover us and He will watch over us. Amen? Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for tonight's teaching. I am so encouraged by your word. Revelation chapter 4 is amazing, Lord, and it shows us that you are truly the center of the universe and that all glory belongs to you. All wisdom, all power, all understanding, everything belongs to you, Lord. So tonight we give you praise and we give you glory. We ask that you use this video that's been recorded on YouTube to encourage saints in the land. And Father, I would pray that those who do watch this on YouTube would play it forward. Pass it on to those who are shaking, shaken in their faith or perhaps doubting or perhaps discouraged or even displeased with what's happening in our land and see that Jesus is Lord and God of all. So we thank you and we praise you tonight. Bless us now as we dismiss in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen and amen. Praise God.